let's get started with uh, the lecture. All right, so the last thing that we saw was an extension to elasticity, uh, something which goes under the name of viscoelasticity. And, and it is very important to consider the real behavior of rocks. Linear elasticity is, is very, very limited. And all of the models based just on linear elasticity are going to be very limited too. We don't have the time in this course to go through everything to make a more realistic model, but I hope that after we finish the course, uh, according to your particular applications, you will, will be able to incorporate each part that may be more critical or not to your particular project. And we, s we saw viscoelasticity, but there are many other things that we need to check off the list from here in order to consider a real deformation of behavior of rocks. And uh, pore elasticity, we're done. Thermal elasticity, we're done. Viscoelasticity, too. We didn't see much equations because then you have several models that uh, are not, uh, that would require a lot of time to, to explain what they are. But, you know, all, all of them, they show more or less the same behavior, those three manifestations of viscoelasticity. And now we'll talk about chemoelasticity. In chemoelasticity, basically we want to take into account the variations in the chemical part of the fluid of, of the solid that are going to generate strains or stresses. Um, for now, we'll just talk about chemoelasticity. Uh, this will be a simpler version of something that we're going to link with it later on, but in many cases, it will be most important the part of chemoplasticity or permanent deformations related to uh, changes of chemistry rather than elastic deformations. But for now, let's just limit it to elastic deformations. All right, similar to what we did before, what we're going to have to do is we're going to modify our as a constitutive equation and in addition to our effective stress law, we could add pore elasticity. We can add the thermal stuff. I'm not going to add it here, but, but we could. I just want to save some space where this is theta. That's a change of temperature. And last, we're going to add one more variable, which is going to, uh, we're going to assume it's isotropic. It could not be isotropic, but we're going to assume it's isotropic. And it's going to depend on a given proportionality coefficient, so this is just a coefficient similar to a thermal dilation coefficient. Let me complete this, if I remember correctly, this is K3 beta, and I think that's it, right? I, th I think that's, that's the term. Yeah, I think it's correct. So in all of these, notice, there is, there is some coefficient same as here at the O coefficient, there is something that changes, which is a variable, call it pressure, call it temperature, or in this case, we're going to call it chemical potential. And for this particular case, uh, we have a K, which is the bulk modulus, because we're assuming that the response is going to develop isotropically and that uh, is going to develop as a change of stress, very similar to what happens with thermal. So at the end of the day, it's just one other change that could produce stresses or strains, very similar to what we saw for temperature. And when you put all of these together, then we're going to have this part is mechanical, this part is 
related to poro elasticity or poro mechanics. Uh, in many problems, it just goes under the name of hydro. This part is thermal, and this part is chemical. And when you put all of these together, uh, this is something which are called thermo hydro mechanical uh, I'm forgetting the chemical thermo hydro chemo mechanical processes and in which all of them are uh, are mixed and then can uh, can act independently and sometimes can lead to things that you will not expect if you were just having some of, of them uh, acting independently. For example, if you could heat up a rock and now you have a porosity and now you have undrained loading, you could have fracturing of the pores because the pressure in the pores is so large that it overcomes the, the strength of the rock and you could have fracturing due to that, undrained loading due to increase of temperature. But if you didn't have pores, you wouldn't be able to have that because if you don't have pores, it will be just solid that expands, you will have no fracturing. So when you combine some of these processes together, then uh, you may have some other processes that, that you didn't see before that now could be very important. And that's something, um, uh, Sometimes this is called multi-physics multi or mortal physical processes or multi-physics problems. And when you have some of these uh, combinations that you didn't have before by applying one of those independently, that's something that goes by the name of emergent phenomena, which is something that you couldn't see without combining some of those processes. All right, let's go now more in detail about the chemical part. Uh, we'll talk about this with a few examples. Example number one chemical sensitivity of shales. Okay, let's consider that we have a, a shale rock. And what, what is one of the major components of shale? clay, right? So if we make a zoom here, a very big zoom out of this rock made of mostly of clay, you will find out that at the nanometer scale, clay looks like a plate with surfaces that are negatively charged. Opposite to, let's say, sand, in which you have a contact which is grain to grain, sometimes in shales and in, uh, and in clays, the clay does not contact another clay plate directly. And at this scale, uh, since these uh, plates are so small, the molecular forces start to play a role and what you're going to have in between the plates and with what is going to keep the plates apart are molecular forces in which here we're going to have water and ions. So water looks like, like a Mickey Mouse head where the hydrogens are here are the ears, and they are positively charged. 
and the oxygen is in the middle and it's negatively charged. So you will have mostly the ears pointing towards the plate. Let's make another one over here. In between, uh, also, this, these are going to be the molecules of water, but in addition to that, we're going to have a brine, and there are going to be some ions. So if we have ions, like for example, a sodium bromide, in which, uh, now let's do sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, in which the sodium is the cation and the chlorine is the anion, then we'll have the sodium to be closer to the plate and the ions of chlorine to be closer to the center. All right. The interesting thing here is that the spacing between these two plates to be in equilibrium is going to depend on how many cations you have in here. The more cations, and in general, the higher the salinity of the fluid, let's call it ionic concentration, the higher the salinity, the more cations you're going to have neutralizing what is the, this uh, negatively charged surface, and therefore the equilibrium distance is going to be smaller. And the lower the ionic concentration, this diffuse cloud of ions is going to get larger. And as a result, you're going to have something like this, in which the spacing between the clays is going to depend on the ionic concentration. And the cause of this, again, is electrical repulsion And for more or less diluted systems, this goes under the name of electrical double layer. But at the end, uh, thi this is just is a cloud of ions that it gets larger as you have less cations, and it gets smaller as you have more. So let's complete this. This is ionic concentration and this is proportional to salinity. It's not a direct function, but uh, it is, uh, well, the chemical potential is not a direct function, but uh, ionic concentration should be. But the higher the salinity, then the lower the equilibrium distance. All right, now this, this is a problem because in, in drilling operations, or when you inject a fluid into a porous medium, usually you do not inject a fluid with the same ionic concentration at which it was originally. For example, if you are drilling through a section that it is sand, shale, and sand, And if you're drilling with a relatively fresh mud, uh, what is going to happen to, to the shale? It's going to expand. And it's going to expand because you're going to be, let me do it with another color. Uh, there's going to be an invasion of the mud, perforation mud into the formation going to get deeper in the sand because it's going to be usually uh, more permeable. But when you get this fresh water into the shale, it's going to lower the salinity of the brine within the shale. And because of that, the spacing, the equilibrium spacing between the, pl the plates is going to get larger. And as a result, it's going to swell. 
and uh, and because of that then if you have constrained swelling what is going to happen so this is uh, let me do it over let me do it right like this this is really mad so this one will be low salinity drilling map uh, oh, okay I, I lost my, my train of thought uh, you were saying Bethany what happens would increase, would increase compression because when you have something that swells but it's not allowed to swell or that wants to swell but it's not allowed to swell instead you get compression and if you get more compression let's say in the hoop direction you may get shear failure because you're going to have more compression in one direction uh, low compression in the other direction talking about that I graded homework number three but I have two missing submissions so uh, please uh, submit that uh, as soon as you can so then because w the shell wants to expand instead we, we're going to have an additional compression is the hoop stress by the way uh, something that I found in many submissions is that at the well of the of the well board you have a sigma RR or a radial stress that was variable and that's wrong okay sigma radial stress along the well board has to be the same because it's just a pressure of the the mod minus the pore pressure so if you had that as a sinus so there is some mistake there all right so in addition to the hoop stress now then we're going to have this additional hoop stress which is going to be let me move this mu over here which is going to be caused by the change in a um, in salinity and the change of chemical potential and that's going to probably increase the hoop stress and if that hoop stress uh, goes beyond the the shear strength of the rock then you're going to have a breakout we're going to get to that uh, later on. okay um, we're not going to go into detail about these equations, but you can relate ionic strength with stresses and derive equations similar to the ones that we did for thermoelasticity and tell what is going to be the additional stress that you have because of the change of salinity. One more thing, and that's why the problem is a little bit more difficult here. Sometimes when you change ionic strength and the, the shale swells, also your sh material may get softer or may get uh, not softer uh, may get weaker so you're not only increasing the stresses but you are also lowering your UCS or your the strength of the rock so the problem it gets actually a, a lot more complicated all right so just for practical purposes let's discuss a little bit what uh, you can do in order to prevent this guy so this uh, kind of chemical mechanical interaction what what can you do in order to avoid these chemical stresses and weakening of the rock uh, due to water freshening within the shale you could uh, you could um, that would be an indirect way so if you increase the weight of your mud, you will make your rock stronger and that, that could relieve some problems, yes. But let's, let's think of some direct action that would change uh, the sensitivity. All right, so what, what would you do then? Okay, so if you had a water-based mud, what would you do to a water-based mud?
let's go for the easy one. All based math, since this is oil, oil is not going to break down the salt uh, cation, so it's just not, not going to get, uh, it's, not, it's not going to hydrate the clay. So it's not going to affect the chemical stability. So if you were to drink with oil, then nothing is going to happen. What about water-based math? What can you do in order to avoid some of these problems? So notice that the problem many times is that you may be drilling with a low salinity mud. So you just add more salt, right? Uh, sometimes that operation, it can be a problem. It becomes too salty, becomes more corrosive. And you know, there are a bunch of problems associated with that. But you could, in principle, increase the salinity and that will solve the problem. And uh, Another thing that you could do is how would you avoid the problem of water inv invasion into the formation? The, the problem is also related that if your pressure within the wellbore is higher than the pressure in the formations, then it's going to tend to filtrate. So if you don't want it to filtrate, then you should do something which is called underbalanced drilling. And this is basically that the pressure in your wellbore, the mud pressure, is going to be smaller than the pore pressure in the formation. If you are doing that, you're going to start producing some fluids into the formation, into the wellbore actually. Uh, but when you have shales, shales usually have a low permeability, so you, it's, not, it's not that you're going to produce a lot of fluids out of shale. It's just going to be a little bit. So underbalanced drilling could be, could be okay for shales, but if you have many sands uh, alternating that shale, uh, you may be producing quite a bit of fluid from, from the sand as well. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, those are the most basic solutions to, to this problem of chemical sensitivity of shale. Again, you know, we can put all the equations together and we could solve for this problem, but well, we're, we're not going to do that uh, right now. Um, we're, not, we're not going to do it later either, but you should know that it's doable. All right, let's see another example of chemical mechanical sensitivity. And this is going to be related to absorption induced deformation. And let me show, show you a video that is going to, to help motivate the discussion here. Okay, let's look at this video. All right. So you can read the title, okay? So start thinking about what's going on in here. This is kind of a robot that, as you see, can walk due to changes of, there, there is no motor inside, there is nothing. But it bends in different directions according to the relative humidity of the environment. And here, you know, you have some other versions, but basically some of the sides of the solid, it reacts with the environmental humidity and deforms. 
Can you tell me a simpler case about what you're seeing here, especially about this one? Something that curls with env environmental humidity. Hair, very well. So hair also reacts with env environmental humidity. Uh, it, it gets curly when the humidity is high and it gets straight when humidity is low. And if we wanted to uh, make a drawing about that, it would be something like this. So here we have relative humidity. If there is very low relative humidity, the hair is relatively uh, straight as relative humidity in increases, starts to bend and sometimes also stretches. And if you have a very high relative humidity, then it might become very curly and actually may, may get longer too. Fortunately, I don't suffer this problem. So I don't know if any of you guys suffer this problem, but I don't. What is going on here is that you have absorption of water, in this case we're talking about water, on the surface of these solids that is making the solid to have a surface stress. And let's make a drawing about that. And we're going to go now into a, a more applied example. If you have a pore made out of organic matter, it happens that organic matter preferentially absorbs some fluids on the surface of the pores. And these fluids preferentially closer to the surface are going to be at a density which is much higher than the density in bulk conditions. And specifically for organic matter, these fluids can be nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and probably most interesting to uh, unconventional resources is also methane. And water too, water also absorbs in this in these pores. Okay. When you have adsorption then as a result as we say we're going to have uh, swelling or uh, not not let me let me uh, rephrase that. As a result you're gonna have absorption induced deformation. So probably here we could have surface stresses, and I mean on the, on the on the walls of the port and absorption induced deformation. And in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, this is going to result in that port, especially at high pressures to expand. The higher the absorption, the higher the expansion of organic matter. Inorganic matter uh, doesn't react that much or doesn't show any absorption induced deformation except for clay. Clay, clay does that too, but in general um, a piece of quartz uh, we would, would not do that. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about sorption, what sorption is in order to understand this problem. And let me do a schematic here of just a, let's say this is the organic matter and it's a solid. What 
we mean with sorption or, or absorption is that you will have molecules at the density which is much higher than the bulk density at the same pressure conditions. And you could think of this as, for example, when water uh, condenses on the surface, right? It's not exactly the same thing. Uh, it's not absorption, it's just condensation. But you could think as molecules of a fluid in equilibrium at a given pressure at a much higher density than the bulk pressure. And this is going to look, if you look at here the density of the molecules and distance in the far field, you will have a bulk density, but when you get close to the wall, to the pore, you're going to have a higher density. And what goes in here, higher than the bulk density, is called excess sorption. And sometimes the maximum density that you have under sorbed conditions can be higher than even the liquid density of the same phase. So we're talking about a very packed uh, system of molecules. Sometimes, again, with a density higher than the liquid density of the fluid. All right, so what do we do with this now? Uh, well, we can measure this, this absorption, and it turns out that the higher the pressure, the higher the amount of this excess sorption. Remember that the excess will be just what is above bulk conditions. And usually for organic matter, this is a nonlinear function that tends to an asymptotic value in which the excess is equal to a function that looks like a Langmuir function. Uh, PL plus P. This is just the, the way this uh, function looks where this NL and PL are, are two constants. Uh, but um, this is what is called a Langmuir isotherm. But now if we put together the sorption and this deformation that we said uh, before, it turns out that the amount of excess sorption and the amount of induced deformation due to volumetric deformation uh, due to the process of adsorption in a in in a range of pressure can be linearly related. So the more sorption you have, the higher the volumetric strain. If you have uh, adsorption, your sample would swell. If you have desorption, your rock would shrink. Similar to temperature too. If you increase the temperature, your rock swells. Decrease the temperature, uh, your rock uh, shrinks. Okay, and once you state this relationship, now we g know that this is a function. Uh, the strains are also a function of sorption, and you can, and in turn, that sorption is a function of pressure. So you can write an equation that is going to look more or less like this, uh, where we have our effective stress law. We're talking about the porous medium, so we're going to have a poroelastic component. And we're going to have one more component that is going to depend on something that is called 
an absorption stress, and in this case, we're going to assume isotropic as well. And absorption stress would be, uh, in simple terms, strain times bulk module, or the stress that you would expect uh, as a function of the uh, pressure. Let's see how this applies in a, in a real case. And this is an example that happens in some reservoirs that are called cold bed methane reservoirs. Are you guys familiar with this kind of reservoir? All right, so this is coal, which is basically so deep that it's not economically uh, it's not economical to mine the coal because it's just too deep. But this coal, many times, is full of methane. Let me finish my schematic, and uh, I'll continue. So this is a coal. This is what is called a coal seam. And a coal is a rock, which is an organic rock. Sometimes with percentage of carbon in the order of 60%, 70%. Sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. But we're talking about a rock which has a lot of uh, organic matter. And here we drill a well bore and we start the pressurizing and we start producing. One of the advantages of this type of reservoir uh, of coal seams is that they are already naturally fractured. And you want to read a very good review about this. It's a, there is a paper from Steve Lovak that talks about that, about coal seams and natural fractures in coal seam. And, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't want to write seam. Uh, this called, these natural fractures are called cleats. But there are plenty of these natural fractures in coal beds. And more or less, they are perpendicular, uh, they are vertical, and they are arranged in orthogonal directions. Okay, since you have already these natural fractures, many times it's not needed to, uh, to have any, any hydraulic fracture. Let's go a little bit more in detail about characterizing this uh, natural fracture formation. Let's say that here we have horizontal stress and here we have permeability of the cold seam. And when I mean the cold seam, I mean including the fractures. What do you think that's going to look like? Higher effective stress, remember this effective stress, I increase effective stress, permeability should decrease, right? And we're talking here about the fracture system. A fracture system opposite to a rock system made out of, of pores has a lot more sensitivity to stress. Uh, a fracture system has a, a lot more sensitivity to stress than a system made out of pores. And because of that, Usually, in naturally fractured systems, or just in fractured systems, porous systems, the permeability is going to depend strongly on effective stress. And this goes with a line in which the logarithm of permeability is inversely proportional 
to effective stress. And when we talk about logarithm, then that means that uh, the, the change is, uh, is quite large when we vary even a little bit of stress. Just to complete the picture here, uh, usually in a fracture porous media or for a simple fracture, permeability is proportional to the thickness of the fracture to the third divided 12 times the spacing between the fractures. So let me make a drawing of that. If we're talking about a very simple system, which sometimes is called uh, a stick match, match stick model, uh, then this one would be spacing between frag. I'm sorry, this one would be the aperture of the fractures, much stick, much stick analogy. Uh, this will be the aperture and this will be the spacing. And when you apply stresses and you close H or the aperture of the fractures, then permeability is going to uh, decrease significantly. So this is 12 times spacing? This is 12, yes, yeah, this is 12, number 12. This is the analytical solution for, for such models. Those of you that may have a qualifying exam, uh, this is the type of questions that are usually asked, uh, especially for transport and things like that. So if you don't know how to derive this equation, please do it, it will be a good exercise. Assuming laminar flow and assuming, you know, many other things, you can get to this. Okay, uh, all right, Let, let's see then what happens now. Uh, we're going to lower the pressure in order to produce gas. This is going to be time. And this is going to be pressure, and I mean here the bottom hole pressure here at the wellbore. And let's say that in this example, we apply a drawdown pressure as a function of time, and then we keep it constant. Okay, first thing. Is total vertical stress going to change? This is something you should, well, this one is easy, but will it change? No, there is a snow, and I agree with that. So either here or there or at the end, SV is not going to change. Let's put this in terms of effective stresses. Uh, now, is effective, uh, well, let, let me not make a mess here. Uh, I, I'll skip that, but effective vertical stress is going to increase, okay? Uh, I want to concentrate here my, uh, my plots on horizontal stress. Okay, uh, second question. What's gonna happen to total horizontal stress? As I lower the pressure, will it decrease? Will it increase? It will decrease. Let's say that it was normal faulting, somewhere around there. I lower the pressure, this is going to decrease. And how much it decreases will depend on that parameter A, if you remember. But effective. Uh, the total horizontal stress is going to decrease and then in theory will stay uh, flat. 
this is going to be S H. All right, sigma H. Let's say that I start at the sigma H somewhere over here. In a typical fractured rock, would and forget a minute that this is uh, organic rock and all of that. Would effective horizontal stress increase or decrease? Let me put it closer to the middle, not so I don't bias your your answer. When I do depletion, I lower the pore pressure under conditions of 1D strain. Okay. Effective stress yeah. always increases. So if I had a sigma H somewhere over here, after applying a drawdown pressure, it's going to increase. And last, and most importantly, what's going to happen with permeability? Will permeability increase or decrease? Let's, uh, for the moment, let's ignore the vertical effective stress. We know vertical effective stress is increasing. But if I have vertical fractures, mostly, then it doesn't matter how much I increase the effective vertical stress. If my fractures are vertical, the permeability is going to depend just on the horizontal stress. So if horizontal stress, then effective stress increases, permeability should decrease. And for some of these fractured media, it decreases a lot. This is a problem with many unconventional formations that they start to produce a lot at the beginning after hydraulic fracturing, but uh, after a short period, when pressure starts to go down, the fractures, they close, permeability goes down, sometimes uh, propane gets embedded, and uh, you lose that prop uh, conductivity, and therefore uh, the production goes down too, very quickly. All right, so this is what we would expect in a rock, typical rock that doesn't exhibit any absor absorption-induced deformation. So let's see what would happen now if we have an organic rock that shrinks when you get fluid out of it. So in this case, the pressure is going down because the pressure is going down we're going to this path, so lower pressure, lower amount of sorption, shrinkage, okay? So let me keep this in here. So let's say that the pressure profile is the same. And let's go first with, uh, probably it's gonna be easier to do it with effective horizontal stress. All right, now as you do depletion in horizontal direction, your rock is, it's not really shrinking because we're assuming that there is more rock besides that rock, but instead stress, if this is not shrinking, but it's trying to shrink, stress is going to decrease. So this is the opposite when when you increase the temperature and the rock tries to expand, but it can expand, it builds a compression stress. If you have it under, under a condition in which it's not allowed to shrink, but it tries to shrink, stress is going to go down. So with adsorption-induced deformation, you could get to cases in which the horizontal effective stress may decrease. Okay, I don't want to 
to write the acronym of absorption induced deformation because they're going to look all awkward. So let me put with uh, uh, shrinkage. Okay, uh, so our effective stress is going to decrease because our effective stress decreases. That means that our hori total horizontal stress also is going to uh, decrease, but it's going to decrease more than without it. This is due to absorption. And what's going to happen with your permeability? If effective horizontal stress instead of increase decreases, then your permeability is going to go up. So in this type of reservoir, it happens that what we observe is the color line, which is totally opposite to what you would expect for another type of rock. Not only that, but there is something very interesting too, and it's easier to look at when you look at the Mohr circles. Let's say that your original condition was this, that shear failure is somewhere around here. What is the effective stress path of depletion? How does a more circle move? Moves with depletion, effective stress are going to increase. They both increase. Horizontal stress doesn't increase as much as the vertical, but it's going to be something like this. So this is the effect of pore pressure change. And let me zoom in there. And this is just the effect of depletion. Okay, but now because of these conditions of desorption induced shrinkage, that's not going to change our pore pressure. So that's not going to change the value of the effective vertical stress, but it's going to change the value of the effective horizontal stress. And what this is going to result is on a more circle than now, the effective vertical stress is going to be the same, but the effective horizontal stress is going to change from here to there. And now this goes this way. And because of that, now you can get to shear failure. This uh, stress path is going directly into shear failure. And if you have shear failure, what's going to happen with your permeability? It's, it's not captured, let me tell you, it's not captured by, by this model. This was a simple model without failure. Why would it decrease? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean with reducing gray, gray size? Okay. So when you go through the, at the beginning of, of depletion and if the rock starts to shrink, some of those fractures may, may open up. So as, as we saw before in this case, 
is going to increase when it gets to shear and especially if you have dilation that's something we're going to see later on some rocks when they are very tight as they fade in shear they dilate imagine like grains of sand going rolling over the other that's a case of dilation but wh when when you have rough fractures is the same when the fracture has to go over the roughness or the asperities of the fracture it will dilate that could increase the permeability even further but when you have a lot of failure and now those asperities start to fail they are going to produce fines and those fines are going to start to plug some of the fractures and eventually that fracture permeability can go down and depending on whether you have clogging or not your permeability could could vary but uh, but may not um, it's not going to increase forever so let me divide this so this was without failure here we have dilation and here we have fines production so it, it actually can get very complicated and, and this is actually what is seen in the field for this type of uh, cold bed uh, methane reservoirs which develop this absorption induced deformation phenomenon that has a very strong effect on permeability with the previous student I had we were studying this same phenomenon for shales and we arrived to the conclusion that it didn't have that much of an impact on permeability but it did have an impact on effective stresses so your effective stresses and total stresses after depletion would not be exactly the ones that you would predict with pore elasticity but then you will have to add this other component related to desorption which also depends on the kind of rock and the total organic and matter content in the rock to see if this is stronger or this is strong or not all right we're done with chemoelasticity so let's see our list see how far we have gone today um, so chemoelasticity we're done we need to start talking about plasticity and I printed the weekly projects but uh, I forgot to, to bring them let, let, let me no I'm not going to be able to bring them because it's already five I don't have my card and I cannot get into the office but uh, let's see if I uploaded it I don't remember I think I did I'll, br I'll bring them next class projects uh, number six okay so we're getting now into plasticity and um, plasticity it's uh, there are two parts of part plasticity one part is to get the equations and find all the equations that are going to tell us when the rock is failing and the other part of plasticity is to predict the strains after they fail so before so far we just have been using this relationship stress is proportional to strain but when you get to failure that doesn't hold anymore and there you have to calculate something which are called uh, plastic strains and and that that's going to be later on but uh, for now uh, the first thing that we're going to do is to find these equations that tell us when the rock is going to fail and especially we're going to look for those equations in terms of shear failure and this is an example of triaxial tests in which we vary the axial stress the confining pressure and the pore pressure inside the rock to tell us 
a characteristic equation that allow us to predict when the rock is going to fail. And we're going to use that in order to calculate what, what, is, what are called breakouts in wellbore. And a breakout is basically the region in the wellbore in which there is shear failure. The more or the higher the, 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 the anisotropy of stresses, the, the higher the proportion of the wall of the wellbore around the, around the wellbore, which is in shear failure, the bigger your breakout is going to be. And how we're going to predict what is the region around the wellbore which is in shear failure we're, with these equations that we're going to see. But we're going to take this to the next step. It's not only to calculate what region is in failure, something that you already did in a previous assignment where you have this sinusoidal function and then you just uh, plotted the line and told me, well, sigma theta theta is above this number. So this region is in shear failure and that region also is going to be the size of the breakout. If this, this sinusoid is slightly above the line, then there is going to be a small region. If this sinusoid is quite a bit above that line, that breakout angle is going to be bigger. Okay, you're going to have to do this, but for deviated wellbores. Okay, this assignment is going to take quite a bit of time. Probably is one of the most difficult ones together with the, with the free fen. And uh, um, I'm, I'm forced to repeat this now, but uh, you have to do it on your own, okay? So you're allowed to, to talk to other classmates about this, but, but do not copy the code from another student. Do not copy the code from, from previous uh, students. I'm gonna post the solution if you need, it, you need that later. If you can't solve it because of time, because of you just didn't get there uh, until the deadline, then just submit whatever you have and then we'll discuss that. I, I understand that there might be you know, some different levels in coding uh, depending on, the, on your abilities and your previous experience with, with, with coding, but this one is gonna be a heavy one on coding and on for loops and all of that. So if you need help, then again, talk to, to me or to Chojin. If at some point you see that, uh, that you, you cannot do it, then just, just don't do it and tell me that uh, at, uh, at which point uh, you get, that's gonna be a lot better than, than getting a zero for, for copying some of the homework, okay? So what I suggest is that this first part is relatively easy. Try to solve it as soon as possible. And the second part is going to take some time. And uh, you may start to code that now and then later refine your code to make sure that it works. But uh, it, it's going to take some time, okay? Uh, so don't try to solve it just in one day or two days because definitely that, that's not going to work. All right, but we'll go to the first part. And the first part is going to be about uh, getting to know when the rock is failing or not, especially in shear, and what is the equation that we need for that. All right. Mm. Okay, then today we'll get started with plasticity and inelasticity. As I was telling you before, so far we have been dealing with a very simple relationship between stress and strain in which 
with linear elasticity, we assume that stresses are proportional to strain. And that's it. Either in compression or in tension, the, uh, we just relate, uh, let me, no, let me, don't, don't make any dot in there because that looks like that's the end of it. It doesn't, it never ends, it just stress is proportional to strain. And in this case, when sigma is proportional to strain and this is a constant, this is linear elasticity. Rocks are not linear. They might be linear in a small range, but usually they are not. Instead, what many times we observe is that we may have a relationship which is more or less like that, in which the more strain you put in, in on a rock, the stiffer it gets. So in this case, this would be a case of nonlinear elasticity as long as if you go, let's say, this path up and then you unload and you get to the same point, same starting point, then this is elastic because all your strains are recovered. An example of a nonlinear material uh, would be, for example, a, a sand pack in which the more stress you apply on the sand pack, the bigger the contacts get. So if at the beginning, let's say the contact is this size, as you apply more and more stress, the contact gets bigger and bigger, and the bigger the contact area, the bigger the stiffness of the rock because you have more solid to solid uh, contact. So this will be increasing stress. And the same thing happens with fractures. Sometimes you can have fracture systems in which fractures are not perfectly flat, but they have some asperities that when you start to compress them, those asperities, they get to contact the rock in the other direction. And sometimes even you may have more contact points along the fracture. So the more stress you apply, the stiffer the rock gets. But in, the, in both of these cases, the strains are recoverable, so we call that elastic, okay? Uh, I have a good example about, well, not a good, ex I already said example, but I have a drawing about this too. When you have a fracture system, and these fractures inside, they start to close, you have at some point the fracture faces uh, touch each other, then that becomes uh, a continuous system and the uh, stiffness gets higher. Okay, so for now an inelastic solid uh, usually will have a region in which if we load there is a proportionality between stress and strain, but there's going to be a maximum value after which if we get to that value stress is not going to increase anymore and if we unload this solid many things can happen but let's just for the moment assume that the slope is going to be the same that that we've had before so if I go through this path, then what I have over here is going to be the recoverable strain. What I have over here is going to be the irrecoverable strain. And if we have irrecoverable strains, that means that now we have an inelastic 
deformation. The maximum value at which we can get is going to call yield stress. And if the stress stays flat, doesn't change with additional strain, that's something that is called perfect plastic behavior. And we're going to see variations of this later on. But uh, this case is called uh, perfect plastic. Usually, this kind of behavior, you can see it in some rocks, but it will be, for rocks, might be more complicated. So let's assume that this is just a bar of, of steel. That's what you, you will usually see with the steel. Not exactly like that, but, uh, but similar to that. You load it, you get to the yield stress, which is the maximum value that the solid can take. It doesn't break, still holds together. You can keep adding strain, and it's going to uh, take this amount of stress to do that. And then when you unload it, it comes back, leaving an irrecoverable strain. It, it means, it, what, what does it mean breaking? Uh, like for microfractures? I don't know. There, well, at, at the, um, pro you're right in the sense that probably for a, for a metal, you may have some sliding of the, the crystal structure of the metal. Mm -hmm. So internally it's break, breaking, but microscopically, microscopically, uh, let me try that again. Microscopically mm -hmm. is going to just look like material that didn't break or, but what I mean with didn't break is just like it didn't just make a fracture and then it was split in, in two parts it's holding together it's yielding a mic and at the micro scale it is failing but it's still one piece okay so in petroleum engineering we have many uh, examples of inelastic strains. Actually, they are mostly everywhere. And uh, it's just that sometimes we simplify our problems in a way that uh, we, we make them more convenient for us to solve. And the easiest thing to do is always linear elasticity. But, but we have to be uh, aware that these problems of elasticity are everywhere. So let's go very quickly through a list of problems where we have irrecoverable strains. And we'll go into the order in which uh, we have all the areas of petroleum uh, engineering. So first, can you tell me where you would expect some in elastic strain in exploration. Let me, as you think, let me get started with my schematic here. Any, any ideas? So, I'm just making a typical offshore case. No? So in exploration, you know, sometimes we send P waves through seismic. That's, that's elastic. It's not inelastic. But uh, another way of finding uh, whether you have a reservoir or, or, or not, well, after you do seismic, uh, what would you look for in seismic, in seismic images? And uh, since I said that, let me make this a little bit uh, through a little bit more realistic. Yeah, but what else? Yeah. 
you're looking for traps, right? So you're looking for traps, and these some of these structural traps may be in the form of uh, an anticline. So if you have something like, like an anti anticline, that means that that's a rock that deformed with time, and the strain was, was not recovered. It just stayed as, as it is uh, right now. And uh, so that would, could be folding. And what else could be also a trap and an example of inelastic deformation? A fault, right? Because if you have a fault, let's say a normal fault, there may be a trap too. And uh, sliding from uh, one part relative to each other, that's something that which is not going to ever be recovered. So that's going to be also an example of an inelastic strain. We're going to see later on that the stresses that cause faults are such that we this is a shear fracture. And if this is a shear fracture, it's going to be explained by a shear failure criterion. And that shear failure criterion, we're going to see that it is equal to the maximum principal stress is going to depend on the minimum principal stress. It's going to be proportional to that through this equation where the friction angle is phi. And this number is more or less about three. So the maximum effective vertical stress is gonna be three times the minimum effective vertical stress. In terms of normal faulting, that means that the minimum effective horizontal stress is going to be about a third of the effective vertical stress. It's, it cannot be lower than that because if it is slower, then you have a fault. So imagine that this is a, an extending environment. As this extends, you will expect that stresses are going to, to get uh, to decrease because it's an extension environment, but this, cannot, this stress cannot decrease forever. At some point, this is going to fail and this is going to be the limit and the minimum effective vertical stress is going to be this one, uh, here, sigma three. Okay, so already in exploration, there are examples of inelastic strains. What about when you drill a well bore? Uh, what example of an inelastic strain uh, you can have breakouts. the breakouts. So, the if this is a, a cross section of the wellbore, as we have seen before, uh, depending on the orientation of the stresses, we're going to have uh, usually breakouts in direction opposite to the maximum horizontal stress and we're gonna have tensor fractures in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. So those are already inelastic strains. So here we put breakout and tensor fracture. Uh, what else can we have? Well, work cuts very well when you when you're drilling. Also, you are you're cutting the rock, and uh, and the process of cutting it involves uh, sometimes a combination of shear and open mode uh, fractures, and those are going to be inelastic strains uh, too. And remember that we're going to concentrate on this later on, but there are inelastic strains everywhere. Uh, what about for completion? Yeah, 
Yes. Are you, are you talking about choosing, not production? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. More like finishing the wellbore to oh. be for production. Um, fracture. Okay. Just making making a fracture, it's already a product of inelastic strain. And uh, let's imagine a conceptual image of a, of a hydraulic fracture that later on we'll see that it might not be true. Okay, but just let's imagine that it is true, in which we have a main hydraulic fracture which is propped. The process of making that fracture is already inelastic. But in addition to that, we know that there is a lot of induce micro seismicity usually close to to fracture what is that uh, bedding bedding planes to what yes So induced micro seismicity is going to be caused by reactivation of mostly shear fractures. And that means that these fractures, as the, the fracture was passing by, as fluids were getting into those fractures and lowering effective stress, those planes arrive to the point of shear failure. So induced micro seismicity is already telling you and is the proof that during hydraulic fracturing there is there are inelastic strains. And that energy that it's uh, lost in the formation, it converts into elastic wave that travel to the geofront in order to pick up that induced seismicity. Okay, um, and uh, yes, Jack. Two questions for the fault. What if the fault is split, was split immediately ago, and uh, what is the decision here? Is the decision here this one? Uh, say again? The stress is, uh, the question is still the same. What may not be the same are the stresses, the current stresses. So that can change. In this case of induced um, micro seismicity, we said that this is, again, for reactivation or rather than fault, since this is quite small, they call it fracture reactivation. And uh, there's an argument if there are fractures or not in some of these shales, but that's, that's another thing, okay? Um, but this is the same equation that we had before. That I'm going to simplify it here, and this is 1 plus sine phi, 1 minus sine of phi, in terms of effective stress. And let's try to start wrapping up. Uh, let me complete this list also in perforations. Those are huge inelastic strains, usually done at a very fast rate. Uh, sometimes in completion, also because of the inelastic strains, uh, you can have also, we, we'll get to this later on, but something which is called a stress shadow. Well, actually, you did this. You remember in free fem for the for the part of uh, the fracture to see how far the stress gets uh, with respect to the fracture? Well, that influence of the stress perpendicular to the fracture and how far it gets, that's what is called stress shadow. And if you have an elastic solution, 
usually that stress shadow is very long. It reaches very, very far away, uh, proportional to the longest direction of the fracture. But if you have a plastic deformation, usually that those stress shadows are a lot shorter. And what that means also is that you could put fractures closer to each other if you were to consider uh, elastoplastic deformation in shale, while if you were just to assume elastic deformation, you would be tempted to put those fractures too far away. Um, but the real behavioral rock is elastoplastic, and that uh, the result of that is that actually you can put fractures uh, closer than what an elastic model would uh, predict. And last, for production, uh, First of all, we can have compaction. If, you, if we have large deformations, uh, let me let me first create small hydraulic fracture here, uh, and. Uh, you, you have large compaction then that's going to be inelastic. You're going to have uh, subsidence. And sometimes if you lower the pore pressure too much, uh, your effective stress could be so high and could get also into an uh, anisotropic uh, state of stress, especially around perforations that if you increase too much effective stress, the rock is going to start to fail. And you could also have here uh, fine production. Or also known as sand production. Sometimes also related to production, you could generate large strains they're going to cause also poor reactivation. There are some, some papers out there that correlate production in uh, fields in Southern California today with earthquakes. And you can see there's a very clear correlation that when they were producing, they were lowering the pore pressure and producing subsidence, compaction and subsidence, uh, you will also reactivate faults. And last, also, if you are injecting, you could also change the pore pressure. And if you increase the pore pressure too much, that also can lead to full reactivation. All right, so all of these are examples of inelastic strains that we're going to uh, talk about uh, um, especially about, uh, don't worry, we're not going to stay here 30 minutes, that we're going to talk about uh, next class, especially in the context of, uh, of uh, wellboard stability. Okay? All right, so I'm just improving my, my schematic here. Uh, and uh, that's, that's it for today, all right? Let me stop this.